Welcome back to Quantum Computing in Practice. I'm your host, Olivia Lanes. Last time we walked through an example of a quantum computing approach to an optimization problem known as max cut, using the Cubo formulation. We went pretty far in depth, but that was just one example of one approach. Today, we are going to discuss near-term applications more broadly and develop our intuition for different types of problems we expect to find useful quantum solutions for, and see some recent examples of some important work done in our community at a utility scale. Previously, we briefly discussed that not all problems have the need for additional computational power, specifically quantum computing, in order to be solved efficiently. These are the problems that you're already most familiar with. Arithmetic, scrolling social media, maybe playing Tetris, Doom, or other video games. We broadly consider these easy problems. On the other hand, there are very hard problems, such as finding prime factors of enormous integers. And this is the basis of RSA encryption and what Shor's algorithm was actually designed to solve. Another example is finding a solution in an unsorted data set. This can theoretically be solved by the quantum algorithm known as Grover's algorithm. However, most experts agree that these types of algorithms will necessitate the implementation of error correction, and we're just not there yet, technologically speaking. So as we go forward in this lesson, and in your quantum educational journey, remember, we are looking for this sweet spot, somewhere here in the middle. It's a hard problem to crack, but that's also what makes it so fun. One thing we've not yet discussed much is computational complexity theory. One of the reasons being is that it can be somewhat intimidating and yes, complex. Computational complexity theory is the field of computer science that aims to classify computational problems by how difficult they are. There are a ton of different complexity classes in classical computing, but the most fundamental are these. P problems. These were problems that can be solved in polynomial time at the scale as the problem increase, meaning that they are easy to solve. The next more difficult type of problem is NP problems, which stands for non-deterministic polynomial. These are problems whose answers can be verified in polynomial time, but not necessarily solved. Next is NP complete. And now we're getting into the really challenging problems with no known polynomial solution. This is where famous problems like the traveling salesman problem and even the game Sudoku live. Now, when quantum computing came to be, at least in theory, people spent a considerable effort trying to figure out what class of problems these new types of computers would be able to solve efficiently. A new class of problems were invented called bounded error quantum polynomial problems, or BQP for short. Their strict definition is a little long, but it is the class of decision problem solvable by a quantum computer in polynomial time with a small chance of error. There's a chance of error because quantum measurement is inherently random but the error probability can be arbitrarily small. Now, all of these classes live in a larger class we call p-space, and this is where we think BQP lives relative to all of the other types of problems. But it's very hard to definitively prove this mathematically. You'll notice that BQP quantum problems do not necessarily overlap with NP-complete problems. However, you might have still seen some quantum computing approaches that aim to solve NP-complete problems. Why would this be? One common misconception is that there is no point in exploring solutions to problems like the traveling salesman and other NP-complete problems for a quantum computer, or any problem where a mathematical proof for a quantum speedup has not been found. However, this doesn't necessarily have to be the case. Finding mathematical proof that a quantum algorithm is faster than its classical counterpart is rare. Shore and Grover are two of the only handful of examples where this has been done so far. But that is okay. In fact, computer scientists still haven't even been able to prove that the classes of P and NP are different, even though all intuition tells us that they must be. Also, comparing two algorithms and how they scale often looks at the worst case scenario for each. It is quite possible that in practice, the worst case scenario is not what we find in real life. So we do not despair. We introduce instead the idea of heuristic solutions. If you're an experimentalist, you already know and love these types of solutions. A heuristic is any approach to solving a problem that is pragmatic, but not necessarily optimal. 
And that's great because solutions don't necessarily have to be optimal in order to be very useful. For instance, think about a financial application. We haven't yet found an exponential speed up for most financial algorithms that quantum could be used for yet, but that doesn't necessarily matter. We don't need an optimal solution, in finance at least, because a solution that is even just 1% more efficient could equate to billions of dollars worth of profit. So how do we know what use cases and problems could be suitable for quantum computing right now? And by that I mean there is significant reason to believe quantum utility or even advantage could be found either now or in the somewhat near future. Maybe it's easier to first name things that the problem should certainly not have. It can't require a huge number of qubits. We don't have processors yet that have thousands to millions of qubits available. That's one of the main reasons Shor's algorithm and the like are so far off. The circuits also can't be incredibly deep. It's really hard for me to tell you exactly what circuit depth won't work because it depends on so many factors. But in general, if your experiment requires a depth that you haven't seen achieved in the literature yet, you might be in for a rough time. And lastly, any type of algorithm that we know will require error correction cannot be done yet. What we should look for, however, are experiments that make use of most of the qubits available on any given QPU. We have also emphasized the importance of error mitigation and suppression. And lastly, there should be an obvious extension to future applications that would be important for society and that we could see eventually leading to quantum advantage. Now let's talk about some examples of use cases which fall into three main categories that we have identified as most likely to see favorable outcomes in the near to middle term. The first area is the simulation of nature. We've spoken about this previously. There are so many opportunities for quantum computers to improve the research being done on the molecular and atomic level. And the reason for this is because current classical methods are limited by fundamentally inefficient mathematical descriptions of atomic structures. Storing and manipulating a quantum state takes an exponential amount of resources on a classical computer, but can be done efficiently on a quantum computer. And that's what makes material simulation and chemical modeling some of the most promising application areas. More specifically, this could lead to developments in carbon dioxide sequestration, alternative batteries, or the invention of new drugs. Some algorithms that are especially relevant in this area are the Variational Quantum Eigensolver, VQE, which is used to estimate certain properties of a material, such as equilibrium or minimum energy states. Another example is the Time Dynamic Simulation, TDS, that algorithm is used to estimate response functions or spectral properties of materials. And I also wanted to mention a newcomer, sample-based quantum diagonalization, which we think we'll be hearing a lot more about in the near future. The next application area is optimization. Now, optimization is pretty ubiquitous in computing, as you can imagine. So the use cases are quite numerous and varied. However, some examples that we hear about a lot are portfolio optimization in finance, industrial design, and also distribution and supply chain. The most common algorithm you will probably hear related to optimization is the one we have already covered in some depth, the Quantum Approximate Optimization Algorithm, or QAOA. Lastly, one area that there has been a lot of excitement for in the past few years is quantum machine learning. Now, I think it's fair to say that it looks like QML isn't going to happen as soon as simulation will, in all likelihood. But nevertheless, there are some impressive algorithms people are working on consistently corresponding to some very important use cases. Some of these possible use cases are natural language processing, network traffic analysis, and even fraud detection in financial transactions. Relevant algorithms in this area are the quantum support vector machine, quantum neural networks, and quantum generative adversarial networks. Now to clarify, those three groups that we just described are broad application areas. It is also worth noting that in the community, there is also benefit to groups working together who are focused on a specific topic. IBM spearheaded an initiative not too long ago called the Working Groups to try to help collaborators meet and create productive synergy in four specific areas. 
healthcare and life science, materials and HPC, high energy physics, and optimization. Here are our current groups and the entities involved in those efforts. If you want to hear more about what the working groups are doing, we have attached four of their white papers in the description below. Now, like I said, I think the best thing to do at this point in the course is to spend some time exploring which sorts of problems people are working on on the cutting edge of this technology and developing our intuition for knowing what types of algorithms are going to work and how to apply them. And before we begin, I just want to make it very clear that the main goal here is not to understand every detail of the experiments. This type of analysis can be very intimidating for even experts if the paper is slightly out of your area of expertise. The goal is simply to help develop an intuition for the types of problems quantum computers are good for and how to handle them. And if you're interested in the finer details, and this has sparked some ideas of your own, I definitely encourage you to go and read the full papers themselves. The specific use cases and papers that we are going to be taking an in-depth look at are these. First, we will explore a paper that discusses simulation of hadron dynamics. This falls into the high energy physics category. Next, we will look at an optimization problem, specifically bias field counter adiabatic quantum optimization. And lastly, we will look at yet another simulation problem, but this time focusing on mRNA, a crucial molecule for drug and therapeutic development. If you're familiar or not with these papers, that's no problem. We are going to walk through them. All three are important papers that tackle problems of substantial size and show how quantum computers are beginning to be used as another method of scientific inquiry. First up is simulating hadron dynamics, and we're going to delve into a paper by Martin Savage's group at the University of Washington called Quantum Simulations of Hadron Dynamics in the Schwinger Model Using 112 Qubits. If you're not a high energy physicist, you might still be familiar with the term hadron, such as in the Large Hadron Collider, or the LHC, which is the giant particle accelerator, 27 kilometers in circumference, that made it possible to finally observe the Higgs boson. Now, a hadron is a subatomic composite particle made up of other small particles called quarks. Some examples would be neutrons and protons. For a little bit of context, the LHC was built to allow for the study of fundamental physics and what happens to particles when they collide at super high energies in the circular tube. By doing this, scientists hope to learn more about how the early universe came into existence. And like I previously said, it was also used to find the Higgs boson, which is an elusive particle responsible for mass of fundamental particles. Now in principle, the interactions of these particles could be simulated from start to finish with a sufficiently powerful quantum computer. We're not quite there yet, but progress is being made. Now the Schwinger model is a simple model used to simulate some of these dynamics and has emerged as one of the most popular models of choice. The details of the model are not super important for right now, but for those curious, it is a model that describes the behavior of electrons and positrons interacting via photons in 1 plus 1d dimensions, meaning that there's one spatial dimension and time. The model has a lot of similarities to quantum chromodynamics, which describes how quarks and hadrons interact. Now, that's extremely hard to simulate. So the Schwinger model is often used as a toy model to investigate some phenomena that are actually common to both. Now the way we are going to proceed with this example and the rest of the examples I have selected here as well is by asking ourselves a series of questions. The first is why did we have reason to believe that simulating this on a quantum computer would work at all? In this case, the electrons and positrons in the Schwinger model have a screening effect causing correlations between distant fermions to decay exponentially with separation. And this means that there aren't as many long range interactions from a qubit on one side of the chip to another on the other side of the chip, which we know is very error prone. So this is really good for the hardware that we have available today. Next, is this topic even of interest? Well, I hope I have already sort of convinced you that yes, high energy physics is of great interest. 
people were willing to spend billions of dollars to build the LHC, and thousands of scientists and technicians across the globe have dedicated their lives to this field. That's how important it is. But the Schringer model is simplistic and isn't designed to cover three spatial dimensions. Nevertheless, it is an important model as it still provides currently testable slices and useful simplification of a full theory. Last, how was this work done, or what approach would they use if they were looking to continue the work? In simulation type experiments, VQE is one of the most common approaches, and is the first step is almost always the same. Prepare the ground state. In this case, it is a vacuum state. And in this experiment, they use a new version of VQE called SC Adapt VQE to prepare both the ground state and the hadron wave packet on top of the vacuum. The next step is to then allow the hadrons to evolve or propagate in time. Lastly, we need to identify the observables that we want to detect. Now, if those steps sounded kind of familiar to you, minus the hadron wave packet part, that's because these steps are very similar to what we covered in the QAOA example in the previous episode. Hopefully, you're starting to see some patterns emerging here. The components needed for VQE are very similar to QAOA. We start in a familiar state, here, the vacuum state, and then we let it evolve in time with a series of exponentiated Hamiltonians, divided into manageable chunks, where n is the number of divisions. The only big difference here is we create the wave packet of hadrons centered within our circuit before we start letting it evolve. So how is this done? Well, the vacuum state is the ground state, and we've already sort of covered how to map this. Now, preparing the hadron wave packet is a bit different. On this vacuum, a hadron can be excited by creating a fermion antifermion pair on adjacent sites. By preparing a superposition of such hadrons at different locations, an arbitrary wave packet can be prepared. The authors centered their wave packet in the middle of the circuit to observe the evolution without exceeding a boundary. But remember, the name of the game when working with noisy QPUs is to keep the circuit depth manageable. To do this, the SC Adapt VQE protocol uses symmetries and hierarchies and length scales to determine low depth quantum circuits for state preparation. The idea is that this will create an ansatz with a smaller number of parameters equating to a shallower depth. More details can of course be found in the paper than we have time to cover here, so make sure to check it out. Now let's take a look at the results. This experiment was run on an IBM Quantum Heron device and implemented a few different types of error mitigation and suppression, including a more recent technique called operator decoherence renormalization, as well as dynamical coupling, zero noise extrapolation, and Pauli twirling. Now let's try to interpret the data. The observable that we're actually going to be measuring to observe how the wave packet propagates is something called the chiral condensate, which is a bit abstract but it's basically a superfluid phase of the hadrons. Now, we can see the wave packet centered here on the sites that have been designated to run this experiment where the color corresponds to the chiral condensate. The left side shows the error-free results from the simulator, while the right side shows the results from the IBM quantum computer Torino. Ideally, these would be mirror images of one another due to symmetry. So you can see that there are some imperfections. Now this vertical y-axis corresponds to the chunks of time I measured earlier, so why don't we take some horizontal cuts through the first and last time steps of the data to see what happens to the wave packet. At time t equals 1, here in orange, corresponding to this cut, you can see that the chiral condensate is narrow and localized. It, it also corresponds really well to the simulation that was done for comparison. At t equals 14, however, though, it is much more spread out and is less localized. Maybe the comparison to the simulator isn't quite as perfect now, but you can still obviously see very good agreement between theory and the data, which is encouraging. In conclusion, this is a very cool example of the type of simulation work you might not initially think about applying quantum computers to. However, in fact, you can, and it works. It's not perfect, 
but you don't have to be a particle physics expert to see that the quantum computer accuracy predicts the outward propagation of the wave packet, which is exactly what we would expect to find. Hopefully future work in this area will continue and high energy physicists will continue to find ways to incorporate quantum computing into their work streams. The aim is to solve theoretical problems more precisely and those which can't be done classically and use experiments to accept or reject theories in hopes of discovering new physics, building improved detectors and leading to a better understanding of nature at its most fundamental level. Our next example focuses on optimization and will be a deep dive into a paper called Bias Field Digitized Counter Adiabatic Quantum Optimization, which was done by members of the Kipu Quantum Team in the University of the Basque Country in Spain. We'll begin like we did before with a series of definitions. The first is counter adiabatic, which is a type of evolution that suppresses non adiabatic effects experienced by a system regardless of how fast those processes occur. Recall the adiabatic theorem from the last episode. You usually need to let a system evolve very slowly if you wish for it to remain in the ground state. This is a big problem because the slower we have to let things evolve, the more time we have for errors to occur. Counter adiabatic driving, often abbreviated as CD, aims to combat this by adding terms that counteract these unwanted excitations. The main idea here is to speed up the whole experiment and reduce quantum circuit depth by suppressing excitations that could lead to spurious transitions. Now let's talk about what a bias field is. Other iterative algorithms like VQE take classical parameters into these states and use classical optimizers to search the many dimensional parameter space for that set that yields a minimum expectation value for a fixed Hamiltonian. In this case, they instead vary the Hamiltonian each time, moving adiabatically from a known case to the case of interest. But since there are no classical parameters being passed and no variational wave function, how do you update your state from one pass at the Hamiltonian to the next? Well, they add a bias field to the Hamiltonian. Whatever the lowest energy state from the previous run, they add a term in the Hamiltonian to the bias the state in favor of that. So why is this experiment of interest? Well, first of all, this is a new approach that could be applied more generally to other optimization problems. But in this case, they applied it to an Ising spin glass problem. As we discussed previously, many combinatorial optimization problems can be reformulated as solving for low energy states of Ising Hamiltonians. The Ising model is a series of microscopic spins distributed on an array. The model can be used to describe a spin glass in which the magnetization is disordered. Basically, the little magnetic moments are oriented randomly in the array. And why did we think this would work? Well, we already sort of covered how we are combating two typical issues found in variational algorithms when we covered the definitions of the paper. But to summarize, the algorithm they are proposing speeds up the evolution to reduce the circuit depth while also suppressing non-adiabatic transitions. Furthermore, it does not rely on any classical optimization routines, which can be an issue leading to barren plateaus and getting stuck at local minima. Lastly, the authors also make sure to align the interactions in the problem Hamiltonian with the hardware connectivity in the real QPUs, which is always very important. Lastly, how does this work? So like I said, there are no classical optimizers being used here like there often is in iterative quantum algorithms. Instead, by feeding the solution from each iteration into the input for the next one, the bias field digitized quantum optimization algorithm incrementally refines the ground state, bringing it closer and closer to the final evolved state. And combined with counter adiabatic protocols, we can do this even with short depth quantum circuits that should run smoothly on noisy hardware. So when the experiment was performed, the authors chose to run the algorithm on the 127 qubit IBM quantum computer Brisbane. Here, the authors show the eighth iteration of the optimization algorithm for a nearest neighbor randomly generated spin glass instance over 100 qubits. They compare ideal simulation results from DCQO and BF DCQO, as well as the experimental result, 
and they also show a result from a classical solver called Yerobi as a reference. Now, with just 10 iterations, BF DCQO provides a drastic enhancement compared to DCQO. Although the experimental result is a bit different than the ideal result due to noise, the performance is still better than the ideal DCQO. This shows that there is still a lot of excellent progress being made with regards to quantum optimization, and good results are being reported on over 100 qubits for one of the first times. Last but not least is a very interesting paper exploring mRNA structure prediction from our friends at Moderna Pharmaceuticals, and it's called mRNA Secondary Structure Prediction Using Utility Scale Quantum Computers. To begin, if you, like me, still haven't taken a biology course in a few years, you can refresh yourself on what mRNA is. Messenger RNA is a type of RNA involved in protein synthesis. It basically reads instructions given by DNA. The secondary structure of mRNA is more or less how the chain is folded, and the RNA secondary structure prediction problem is the problem of finding the most stable folding of the sequence of bases of nucleotides that make up DNA and RNA. That would be C, G, U, and A. This image here shows some of the common folding structures found in mRNA. Each color highlighting here shows a different secondary structure. But the exact characteristics for what makes one of these structures more favorable over another isn't well understood. All we can do is figure out which one has the lowest free energy compared to the unfolded state. And that's where quantum computers step in. So why are mRNA secondary structures important? Well, accurate prediction of them is actually crucial in not only understanding DNA and our genes, but also for designing RNA-based therapeutics, like the COVID-19 vaccine. There is reason to believe that the approach in this paper would work because this has long been known to be a formidable optimization problem for classical computers due to the vast number of possible configurations. And for some configurations, it's actually known to be an NP-complete problem. However, on a quantum computer, we can formulate the secondary structure prediction as a binary optimization problem, something we know how to handle. Furthermore, there has been evidence in the literature already of accurate RNA prediction on small-scale quantum devices and quantum simulators. So the obvious question is, would this work on larger hardware? The experiment is done by using something called the conditional value at risk variational quantum eigensolver, which is a modification to the traditional VQE algorithm and is expected to achieve better convergence. This plot shows the distribution of measurement probabilities of the sample bit strings with the corresponding energies for 42 nucleotide 80 qubit instance. Here, the bit strings symbolize pairings of the nucleotides. It illustrates that the lowest energy bit string has an energy value of minus 140, which matches the lowest energy bit string found by the comparative classical solver. So that's great. And this is the optimal folded structure of that nucleotide chain based on the lowest energy bit string the hardware has found. And with that, we have reached the conclusion of this episode. Now, my aim here was not to overwhelm you with details from different research papers, like I said. I simply wanted to give you enough context to understand what cutting edge work in the field looks like right now. The hope is that this will get some gears turning in everybody's head and that by seeing how others are approaching problems, you will be able to make connections and have the confidence to attempt new quantum experiments that you might not have before. And hey, maybe some of those won't pan out, and that's fine. That's why this is research. Going forward, remember that the types of problems that we are interested in can be grouped by either methodology or by subject, and we have laid out the ones that we believe to be the most promising in the short term. Remember, quantum computing isn't good for everything. And really, this is just a testament to how good we've gotten at classical computing. Just because you think you could apply quantum computing to a problem doesn't mean it's going to yield interesting results. Unfortunately, you have to consider the scaling. Circuit depth is a double-edged sword. We need it to be considerably large to do interesting work that classical computers can't. But right now, because of the hardware noise, we can't push it to huge sizes because the fidelity will diminish. 
It's all about finding that sweet spot and knowing that it is a moving target. So take some time in between now and the next episode to really think about some problems that you have come across and how you might want to approach them with what we have learned up until this point. Be creative and don't limit yourself. And if you have any ideas, even if you think they're a little bit crazy, let me know in the comments below. Thanks for watching and I'll see you next time.